Okay, so this is a conversation with Peter Catt. Um, Peter is the Dean of the Cathedral in Brisbane, but he has a very interesting life. Um, good morning, Peter. How are you? Good morning. I'm well, thank you. It's great to be right. part of this. Yes. We love your backdrop. It's, um, it's uh, taken in Arles in southern France, and it's the um, asylum where Van Gogh spent a lot of his time. Which I right. think is a picture for our time, I think. <laughs> yes, I was going to ask, was it chosen deliberately? <laughs> so, Peter, do you want to just tell us perhaps a little bit about yourself? Just give us a background, um, who you are, what are the significant life experiences so far? Well, um, yeah, okay. Um, I was born. I was born in an atheistical household. Um, my father was formed as an Anglican um, in a diocese to the south of here, and um, he developed a real sense of um, a passion for social justice, and that led him away from the church, which was a real tragedy, really. Um, so I grew up. I grew up without hardly any church. A little bit of Sunday school because. Uh, the lady over the road was an elder in the Presbyterian Church, and she persuaded my parents to let her take us to Sunday school for a few weeks. It was only a few weeks. Um, so my my burning passion um, as I was growing up was um, science. I was formed by Doctor Who, Thunderbirds, uh, Lost in Space, uh, those sort of programs, and that's that was the path I took. <coughs> um, until, until I realised that uh, transcendent moments, which I'd been experiencing, experiencing in the bush um, and right through science, used to have absolute transcendent moments studying bacteria, um, until I actually worked out that some people in the church were actually into transcendence as well. And uh, music was an important part of that. <coughs> I, I think I walked in, I think it must have been, because um, I was so naive about church, I had no idea what was happening. I walked into what I think was an illegal Tridentine mass <coughs> being celebrated in eastern suburbs of Sydney when I was out walking one night and saw a small group of people who were absolutely captivated by what they were doing and having a transcendent experience and they were singing a language I didn't understand. Um, very simple, so I guess it was some sort of plain song because I had no idea of any of that technical language in those days. <clears throat> but um, when I saw what they were experiencing, it sort of knitted a whole lot of stuff together for me. And that led me into the church. And I made another surprise discovery, and that was that there are actually parts of the church who actually thought that social justice was actually a compelling part of the gospel. So it all sort of knitted back together in the fullness of time. So, Peter, there's, there's no church in your, in your background. Mm. Is there music in your background? Were you, were uh, you, you yeah, my dad, piano uh, My dad was a passionate uh, jazz listener. Um, I learned the clarinet. Uh, I was told by my year three teacher when I was eight that I would never be able to sing. She was running lunchtime auditions for a choir and had all the little people lined up in the weatherboard veranda, or the veranda of a weatherboard building, and just filed us through played some notes and said, sing that. And I went, Ugh. she said, Peter, you'll never be able to sing next. I uh, rediscovered music when I was 16, or singing anyway, rediscovered music when I was 16, when the then music master of the school heard me mumbling away in the national anthem and asked me to join the choir because I would make a really good bass. So I sang bass for, um, I struggled to sing bass for about um, 13 years until just after I was ordained. And someone else said, why don't you try being a tenor? And I said, I have no idea what that is, so tell me what to do. So I'm just waiting for the next, next revelation. I could be a contralto next, who knows? Ah, that's right. <laughs> on, onward and upward. 
<laughs> this is fascinating for me. I've known Peter. Peter's my boss. I guess you all know that. And I've known Peter now for quite a number of years, but already I've learned stuff um, about Peter. Peter, what, what are, as, as pieces, as repertoire, as music perhaps, as genre of music maybe, what are highlights for you? What, what, what is the music that excites you, either liturgically or even non-liturgically? Um, I've got a very wide range of musical tastes, I think. Um, when I'm cooking, I like listening to jazz or Spanish guitar or acoustic guitar music, a lot of it's Spanish. Um, in terms of church music, um, I love pieces like the Allegri Miserere, uh, David uh, Andrew Ford's uh, Missa Brevis that he wrote for us a few years ago. Um, some of the most transformative pieces for me liturgically are the mass settings by uh, Wood and Jackson um, <clears throat> and Dark. And that's partly because they were the first mass settings I was exposed to. Um, I was fortunate enough while I was at university to discover St. James King Street and learnt a lot about music and liturgy and the integration of the two. And also saw some of the conflicts that happened between clergy and uh, musicians. So, but, um, you know, my favourite hymn is Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence, um, partly because of the tune, but partly because of the theology that it captures and accentuates. So it's a pretty broad range of stuff. And, and you make reference to kind of moments that have actually have kind of taken you, you, you to a particular place. Mm. Perhaps it's too early in the conversation to ask this, but... If that's true for us all, what are the implications for church music? You know, if we, if we respond to music mm. out of the experiences of life that we've previously had, what, what does that mean for people who are then trying to structure worship, which is actually corporate and has meaning to the people who have assembled in the community? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's a fraught, in one way, it's a fraught process. I mean, as we know, with choosing hymns, uh, um, a hymn that I think is fantastic and transformative and uh, I, you know, I think I, let, uh, a few months ago we had Little Mortal Flesh Keep Silence and one of my colleagues said, isn't that the most ridiculous hymn you've ever heard in your life? And <laughs> I actually said to her, well, actually it's my favourite hymn. Um, <clears throat> so it is, a, I mean, it's a fraught process, but that's also why I think the repertoire needs to be broad and um, we all need to use music that we don't particularly like ourselves, knowing that it's actually serving a much wider range of people. At the same time, being really attentive to what we're trying to, uh, what we're asking of the music, um, making sure we don't create uh, dissonance that just isn't helpful, like, you know, a reflection piece after a sermon or during communion that starts off with a sort of full stops and jolts people, unless, unless you actually thought that's what the sermon was meant to do or something. But it's about understanding the flow of the liturgy and being sensitive to it and being open to using a broad range of music that will speak to different people. I would make a hopeless politician, and I hope I made a better teacher. It seems to me education and politics have something in common, and that is that there is a tension between the extent to which you lead a community and the extent to which you reflect a community. Mm. Schools are all about these days, about you know, schools reflecting the community in which they're in. And I think they talk less about being transformative of the community. That's got to be the same tension for, a, for, for, for clergy and sure. indeed for musicians in the church. Sure. Do you have anything to say about kind of how you reconcile that tension or how that tension might be resolved in specifics, you know, in a church context? To what extent do I give the people what they need? To what extent do I try and lead them somewhere else? And how do I do that? Um, slowly and... Um... I think, I think it's about, I think it's being and making, I think it's always about making the space safe and 
and and and it's about introducing new stuff or challenging stuff in ways that are not confrontational. Um, you know, there are, there are all sorts of genius ways to introduce people to new music, like you know using using it as a riff during a com communion time or something like that to sensitise people to to new music, placing it well in the liturgy. It's a, I think it's a disaster to to put a, a spanking new hymn as the last hymn. Um, if people haven't been somehow sensitised to it, and I, but I always think there should be. The, I think we should just live in that tension of of feeding people with stuff that's familiar and speaks to them and gives them comfort at the same time as introducing stuff that. Uh, might just makes them, make them at least a little bit uncomfortable sometimes, or or just give a new insight that is one of the aha moments. Um, so it, and it's about doing it in ways that are confrontational and understand that we're all fragile and we all need to be gently led places rather than bashed. Musicians, I'm sure, and, and not only musicians, but musicians kind of feel that the, their view of themselves is wrapped up in the music that they present to other people. And therefore that we can be judged, if that's the right word, by the music we present to other people. I don't know whether clergy feel the same tension, which actually therefore would be played out in, you know, to what extent there are theological ideas presented in your cathedral that you yourself don't necessarily agree with mm. and where one stands in that world. Mm. Um, do you want to comment on that either from the clergy point of perspective or indeed on as advice to musicians of what do we need to believe or feel inside ourselves that allow us to let go of ego mm. in um, the sense of we might be judged for what people perceive of us. Does that make sense? It does. And I, I think that's where, where the, common, the common thread of actually having a spirituality uh, comes to the fore. Because um, we, have, we have to understand what our boundaries are. I mean, there's, there, there's, stuff, there's stuff that I simply will not have sung um, because I think it is uh, theologically destructive stuff to sing. Um, at the same time, just making sure that I'm not being precious and expecting all of the, everything to be theologically where Peter Cat happens to be at the moment. But I guess one of the gifts of having been ordained for three decades is actually realizing that I've shifted theologically. So um, I can have, you know, I've, it's, it, it isn't about me and it isn't about where I'm at at the moment. And so there's a, there's a, it's allowing for a theological and musical latitude while at the same time, you know, if you're a, mus if you're a musician, um, that doesn't mean you've actually got to tolerate use of absolute trash, um, if that's what musicians call it. Um, just like there, for me, there are theological boundaries that I think are, are well and truly uh, definite that are not likely to shift and would find it very troubling if I shifted into that sort of space and find it troubling when the church does. and. You know, we see some of that played out in America where the church, some of the church has strayed into uh, idolatrous, nationalistic, militaristic pl uh, place that has to be avoided, I think. Yeah, very interesting comments. And part of it is I, I respond to is your comment about music not being trash, if that's what you call it, which of course highlights the fact that somebody's trash is another person's treasure. Yeah. And um, perhaps in the end that, that helps us or encourages us, and, you know, the advice there is that we as musicians 
um, not only need to be um, broadly based in the way that we view church music, but perhaps we need to upskill ourselves so that our own taste in music is broadened by those kinds of experiences that we have um, while we're actually being, um, while we're being skilled. Mm. The other thing that, that I think there's a tension between, isn't there? And of course, everything is so excitingly multifaceted. But do you want to talk uh, for you about the relationship between words and music? Because you have spoken about words that are problematic for you. And certainly when we have discussions in our staff meetings, the words that are problematic for you are problematic for me too. But I wonder whether there is also a sense in which we can accept texts, let's say quite old texts, texts from the tradition of the church, mm. which we no longer would quite believe in the, in the same way, but because they belong to that tradition. Mm. And for instance, as an example, although this is not necessarily music, I just wonder how many of the people who say the creed Sunday by Sunday actually see it as a statement of what they believe or should believe, or whether they see it in some other terms. Mm. Well, I, I, you know, I think that's actually where music helps us because you know, the one, I think one of the problems that we have created for ourselves, and the creed is a really good example of it, is that we have uh, used the creed as a way of trying to explain mysteries when in fact the creed was developed in order to maintain a mystery and not to explain it. And sometimes I think, you know, like we're going to have a sung creed in the next couple of weeks. And I, and I actually find adding music to the creed can be really quite helpful because it, um, it can take it away from being a text that locks things down and liberate it into an experience that is part of the tradition and and has new things to teach us. I, whenever we have a sun creed, I, I look forward to um, hearing what the composer is going to do with the incarnatus you know, and, and Christ became truly human. So is the is, is, is the composer going to turn that into a really moment uh, of deep solemnity where we have this uh, sense of we have to be awestruck and almost or, or even a bit sort of frightened by this idea of Christ becoming human or is the composer going to see it more of as, as Christ dancing into the picture or is the composer going to see it as Christ on a mission come to fix the world? I mean, how, how is that composer going to actually play with that text and what new meaning am I going to discover because the composer has done something with it I maybe didn't expect? And so it keeps, it, it sort of frees the creed and, and frees a lot of our texts, I think, from being locked down by our over fascination with literalism which is a product of the scientific paradigm, which I'm very fond of, but, uh, but um, sometimes I think people of faith feel like they have to compete with science. They have to be more scientific than science. And, uh, and um, music is one of the things that rescues us from that really quite destructive movement. Peter, I'm inclined to say, let's stop the discussion there. I mean, I'm not going to. But for me, I think that is a fabulous um, view of what church music can be. And, you know, it says so much, for, particularly for people like myself for a lot of my life, who kind of have this sense that a creed is what you believe and then music and poetry are, are, are not what you believe. They're just imaginative ways of seeing the world. Mm. There's a guy, again, in the book that I referred to at the beginning, um, Music and Faith, there is a fabulous um, thing that says exactly the same thing. And it's from Nick Brown, who was a, a parish priest in England. I think from memory, he might have even been on the staff at St. Paul's Cathedral for a time. Um, and he says that he sees music as significant because it can create a space 
imagination as well as intellect are teased. Mm. Imagination, perhaps in the sense of imagining God and teasing in the sense of teased out, explored, discovered mm. in a place that is church, which creates a space where people can find that they have been already found by God. Mm. Um, but we think we go to church to find God. Mm. We actually go to church to find that we have already been found. Yeah, we've already been found. Um, so I think that works really well, but it seems to me also that it works, it works in a cathedral. You know, St. John's Cathedral, um, I'm not bragging, but it's a pretty spectacular building with an amazing acoustic, and you just can't walk in place without a sense of awe um, and wonder. Um, and so plain or messian or anything that might be in inverted commas, strange musically, somehow becomes absorbed into the building and loses that strangeness. What about parish music? And I mean, I don't even know, I must say, much about your experiences. I know you've been Grafton Cathedral and Newcastle Cathedral figured um, significantly at some stages of your life. But is there a, a difference between the way we would view music in a different place? Um, no, I think, I think it's all about what works. Um, between Newcastle Cathedral and Grafton Cathedral, I was parish priest of a working class um, community in Newcastle, a very depressed and depressing place. Um, and, but music played an incredibly important role in worship in that place. It was about using the using uh, hymnody and mass settings. We, we had a son, we had we had three Eucharists, a son, uh, one on Saturday night, and one we had, I had two centres, um, so one Saturday night service and one service in each of the two centres. And one of the morning services was sung, congregational, but we had a little choir that would sometimes sing, uh, sing a Eucharistic setting, simple one. Uh, and one of the important things was that it was authentic to the people and their capacity. Um, you know, when I was on the cathedral staff, there was another there was another parish church uh, almost down the road, well, it was down the road from the cathedral that had even song at the same time as the cathedral and could never understand why people preferred to go to the cathedral rather than to the little parish church, because it was using all the same music. And this is, you know, choir that wasn't cathedral standard and all that sort of stuff. So you know, one of the, one of the um, seductions can be trying to be something you're not. And, you know, even we could, you know, cathedrals can fall for that trick too. Um, it's about working out who you are and what you're trying to do and being authentic to yourself. So there's, you know, there's, there's music that we wouldn't try here and neither, sh neither should we. Um, but in that little parish, the music was transformative. Um, they were very open to singing new stuff. Um, and they use lots of stuff like Taze music and um, music from the Iona community and people like that. And it was beautiful and transformative and, you know, the crucified and risen one turned up and we had transformative moments um, and it was beautiful. Do you want to share some, I mean, every staff meetings you'll actually say, oh, back in Grafton or back in Newcastle or whatever, and you'll refer to a moment has actually in some way stayed with you. Yeah. Do you have any of those that you'd like to share with us? They perhaps inform something about music or about you. Well, I think one of well, I think one of the um, key things for me is often those moments are musical moments, and um, I think there's a beautiful theological thing um, happening in the middle of that. Uh, in, in the Eucharist, we talk about. Uh, the, you know, there's a tech, the technical term for what we're experiencing in the Eucharist is anamnesis, which is a Greek word for which there is no English translation. It's the word that gets 
translate it as you know, in remembrance of me or in remembrance of uh, in the Eucharist, which is a really poor and misleading uh, translation. It gets, makes people have the idea that they have to sort of take a moment to think sweet things about Jesus to remember him um, in that moment, otherwise the Eucharistic moment's lost. But um, an anamnesis literally means for time to collapse. So theologically, anamnesis means that at that moment we're sitting in the Last Supper with, with Jesus and the disciples, we're supersonically present to ourselves in the moment, but we're also part of the heavenly banquet and the fulfilment of all time. So time has actually collapsed. And music is one of the things that makes me realise just how real anamnesis is. Um, you know, when, whenever the choir, whenever the choir sings dark in F, I lose 35 years of my life and find myself back in St. James King Street. And it's like those intervening years have just collapsed in on themselves. And there are, there are plenty of, um, moments like that and and sometimes it's just because not because of the particular piece of music and its meaning but what was happening at the time like there's you know, there are a couple of hymns that just as we sing them i get these incredibly powerful flashbacks to uh, either beresfield my little parish church or to grafton or to Newcastle or to St James and or even to other other times um, here and it's it's so profound the way the time just collapses and feelings that I had then I recapture so I rediscover something about myself I'm asked to reflect on something that happened in the past um, and all, all because there's been this beautiful musical trigger and, and the, the, the ones I particularly enjoy are the ones that sort of, I, I, you know, like if we're singing Dark in F, I know it's going to happen, but there are other times when I think, oh, that's amazing. Um, so it's that power of music to transform or transport us and to, to play with time. Um, that's, I think, one of the great things about music is that it breaks down so many of the binaries and the linearities and things that we just think are reality. And it says, hey, reality actually looks very different, you know, because you know, the, the veil is thin and time, time is not just a marching linear thing. This, there's a whole lot of complexity going on here. And if we if we attend to those moments, then we can go down a path of awe and inspiration and reflection that makes some of the theological arguments we spend our times having look like the nonsense that they are. That's, that's wonderful. I wonder whether at a practical, there are some implications though, for those of us who um, have to deal um, how does music work for young people in the church? How do we connect with you, young people? And we often feel that music maybe is something that, that we can with them on their terms. And I'm not disputing that and I'm not creating an argument here. Okay. From what you're saying, it's almost like those early years could be foundational in creating the musical experience that will inform us in life and which we can then look back on. I remember years ago, my parish pastor um, gave a concert in the Greek Orthodox Church and we warmed up in the Sunday school room. I was really impressed with all the stuff around the walls, which were um, uh, teaching, embedding their Sunday school students in Greek Orthodox culture, yeah. which clearly was so different from the culture that happened in the moment you stepped out the door. And I wonder whether as a church we've actually failed to actually decide that is a culture of church music and we can enculturate people into it. Yeah, absolutely. Go back to Jonathan Arnold for a minute um, because he has what for me was really interesting. 
Um, and this coming from a church musician who loves contemporary music, as you know, speaking to his boss, a dean who also loves contemporary um, music, um, whatever that means. Um, Jonathan asks parallels between medieval Christianity and 21st century Christianity. And the parallels for him are these, that both times, medieval period and now, there are high levels of biblical illiteracy. There's a high spiritual nourishment through arts and the aesthetic. And there's an emphasis on experience and encounter above textual and intellectual comprehension. Um, do you want to kind of amplify, comment, explain, uh, disagree? And with any of that? Well, no, I agree. I agree. I think I think um, one of the things that we, we we have not attended to well, particularly in the Western and sort of sort of the it, one of the consequences of the of the Reformation, which was a really necessary thing, uh, and the and it's and it's sort of running into the enlightenment was that we actually got carried away with facts and we even turned belief into um, creedal type um, yeah cre approach cre creedal approach to faith um, and we lost the idea that it is actually about experience and about encounter and I, it and, and music, even 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 often, music has become utilitarian. Um, and I think it's one of music is one of the things that can save us from that. And I actually I actually don't think that the divide, the alleged divide um, between young and old. And, uh, yeah, I, I think all of those binaries are. Uh, are constructs that are really unhelpful because I know lots of young people who love um, plain song and you know, they, they might find they might find the way we do church a lot of the time boring that's but you know pe people need to belong first I mean I, I know lots of young people who go to to uh, Hillsong, and a lot of that experience drives them crazy. But they, that's where their friends go. So you know, it's, I think sometimes we attend to the wrong things. I think it's about attending to belonging, and we've only got to see what effect being formed in church music has on choristers and the long, the, how that is a lifelong transformation. And I think if we just attended better to enculturating people rather than, you know, the idea of church being relevant, um, whatever that means, is one of the things I find most nonsensical because church is incredibly relevant if you actually believe what you're doing and you love what you're doing. And, you know, that's what converted me was actually seeing a bunch of people who were transfixed and transformed. Um, and you know, people do have a hunger for spirituality, but they don't, they actually don't expect to encounter it in the church because the church is seen as being sort of caught up about who can marry who and you know, all those sort of things rather than actually engaging in an experience of the living God when you actually come to the church. And, and that's a wider question, but it's, it's almost the dilemma between church as community, a worship community, but that emphasis on community, and yet somehow we sometimes forget, encourage people to see it as mentally active. And I don't necessarily mean that has to be patient with, I don't know, processions or people dancing or whatever, but it actually is a mentally active place where you are responsive. I say to the choristers all the time, a state of mind you can get over that quite easily you can choose to be bored you could choose not it's a little bit of that when we approach church music or indeed when we approach worship generally i think and, and boredom i mean boredom is one of the most underestimated things in our culture um, 
boredom is the gateway to insight, creativity, and uh, transformation. And we've got to we've got to learn how to uh, cultivate a bit more boredom. I think. I think. Oh. Entertaining, entertaining people is is the way of just numbing them and turning them into TV watching um, consumers. Yeah, there's a lot of research coming out just now exactly on that area that the, you know, the with social media is we're not teaching our kids particularly. We're not allowing ourselves bored. Out of boredom comes creativity and imagination, just as you've said, Peter. Um, we often talk about the fact that if they divide between musicians and clergy, part of it is that clergy training at the Anglican Church, at least in our diocese, but I would imagine most places, has very little, if anything, to do with music. And I wonder whether you'd like to advise or talk to us about what you think a clergy musical preparation program would consist of? What, what would you like your fellow clergy people to understand about music? Yeah, I, I think, I think you know, certainly on the money. And, and surprisingly, the uh, training doesn't even include training in liturgy. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it, it's a real, um, so much of our training has fallen into the the knowledge base sort of economy uh, rather than um, learning the craft and, um, and and even Christian formation as well I have to say has gone down that track. Um, I, I was actually very fortunate in that when I went to St John's College in Morpeth um, training in liturgy and in music, the role of music in liturgy was actually, um, was, had actually a very high place in our training. So we actually, you know, we actually had to learn how to sing the office. Um, we were given handbooks on music. We were given um, advice on how psalm chants could be chosen even for small parishes. There was just this, just this uh, assumption that music would work anywhere. We had a church musician, theologian, ordain, an ordained musician come and work with us uh, one morning a week, every week. Um, and, you know, it was just assumed that if you were going to be ordained, you actually had to understand how music worked because it was such an important part of the liturgy and you had to understand how to create liturgy because it's who we are. You know, the, um, it, it's not about having a theological degree. I mean, you do need a theological degree, but, but the form, our formation certainly then was focused on doing theological, we, so we had a morning of theological reflection every week. We had uh, a morning of church music. We, part we actually had to sing even song once a week and matins once a week. And, and we actually lived into the uh, experience. And so, it's, you know, it's not, it's, it's, I think it's no surprise that people who were in college with me um, ended up being deans of cathedrals and um, parish priests in places with really significant musical traditions. Because, you know, we were actually, that's how we, it was just formed with an expectation and that's what a priest did. A priest did. And, and theology, theology and music were actually all yeah, we actually we had um, you know we had Brian Wren come and talk to us for three days straight. Uh, we had a visit from John Bell, um, and so we had that idea that um, for for worship to work, you actually had to have a really engaged understanding of music and how hymns were chosen, and how hymns worked, and where they worked in the liturgy and. <clears throat> with the liturgy to make the liturgy work. Um, <clears throat> Do you have any insight as to what no longer happens or in fact only ever happened in isolated places? 
Um, yeah, uh, the invention of the paid degree. Uh, <coughs> um, and just the fact these days that we, um, we're trying to do too much in too little time, which is the story of our culture. So these days, like when I was, when I was a theological student, I went, you know, and it's always dangerous to start to say in the good old days, but you know, when I was a theological student, we went to college and lived on site for three years with our families. Um, we worshiped together um, 15 times a week. Um, we had all of those intentional bits of formation. Nowadays, people are expected to pay for their degrees. They've got full-time jobs. They're doing a formation program concurrently. And they've got a placement as well as, you know, trying to just get it and try and do all of that in three years. Might there also partly the sense that they, because there isn't common agreement as to what such music might be, it's kind of, um, it's all abandoned? Uh, it could be, but I just think, I think it's just the fact that everything, everything, just everything else has been pushed out, out, of, um, um, out of the program because you know, formation now happens over a couple of weekends a year for three years. years. Yeah. Okay, so that's fixing up clergy or not fixing up clergy is the hard question. What, what advice, and that's not the right way, what would you like to say to the church musician community? As a clergyman, what do you want us to be uh, sensitive to, aware to, do better, do differently? Uh, and this is Peter Katz's view, of course, he's not speaking yeah, course, yeah, for yeah. the whole church. Well, I, I guess what I would, all, what I'm always looking for, and I have to say I've always enjoyed with the people I've worked with, is a sense that we are actually collaborators, and that the the liturgy is not divided into the bits over which the priest has control and the bits over which the church musicians have control and those things happen in sort of separate little whirlpools. It, um, if, if there, it, it's all about relationship and it's all about working together and it's all about, um, and, 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 and it's, it's about attending to each other and attending to the people. I think um, one of the most powerful things we can do is understand that we are first and foremost, servants, servants to the liturgy and servants to the people. And that doesn't mean delivering up to them just, you know, it's not about just delivering up sort of safe material, but actually seeing as ourselves as part of a community. And just as, as, a, as a good preacher gets shaped by the community and what the preacher preaches is actually shaped by the conversations one is having with the community. I think um, church music at its best is music that is shaped, be shaped well by musicians who are actually engaged as part of the community and who are actually engaged with their own spirituality. So, you know, understanding, you know, having a really good, just like clergy need to, a really good understanding of the technicalities of it all, but at the same time, allowing that to be informed by your own spiritual life, your emotional life, um, having some theology, you know, do, actually having theological conversations with the other people who you work with, um, so that you're actually exploring together uh, what works and what doesn't, what's appropriate, what isn't, um, and, and having the confidence to be able to put forward why you think something should be done, um, if, even if you're 
praise things that shouldn't and and have if you know if the relationship is good enough you can actually walk into that territory and have a conversation and both learn something so making it more dialogical um yeah and so yeah and it's about and and attend you know and allow yourself allow yourself to attend to yourself so what you know what is the music doing to you um not just in terms of the technicality of performance but you know, what's going on in your heart and your soul when you sing this stuff or you play this stuff okay so thank you everyone for attending i have found it enjoyable um and peter especially thank you to you for to come in and sit here on a saturday morning and not know not have a clue what's going to happen and um, be part of that um, can I remind all the people who are here, who I know are connected with RSEM, that it is still very much our intention that the RSEM Winter School will happen next July. And when it does, you'll be able to worship in Peter's Cathedral, if I'm allowed to call it Peter's Cathedral. And um, most likely, almost certainly, um, the Dean of Brisbane will be the preacher on that. Day. So we'll see you all in Brisbane and um, we'll keep in touch with you if there are any other like this that you might find helpful. Thank you, Peter, very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you.